Boston once a vaccine for COVID is available, but until then, we're all on Zoom. The purpose of my first seminar today is to introduce you to the field of applied ontologies, which is a branch of artificial intelligence. The term ontology stems from philosophy as the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being. It deals with questions about what things exist or can be said to exist and how such entities can be grouped according to similarities and differences. Within artificial intelligence, applied ontologies take on a more practical focus of defining a set of concepts and categories in a subject area or domain that shows their properties and the relations between them. The field of applied ontologies has grown out of a tradition of research that has spanned the last 70 years and that has been referred to as knowledge representation. In this seminar, we will cover what is knowledge representation, what is an ontology, what is a semantic web, and how do we engineer an ontology? Sadly, due to the time limitations, each will be briefly covered as these topics alone are often covered in an entire course, which I'm teaching right now. So the first question is, what is a knowledge representation? What does it mean to represent knowledge? Well, why do we care about representing knowledge? Why is it important? Uh, well, Davenport, who is a well-known thought leader in uh, management science and in business management, uh, wrote in 1998, back in the time when uh, there was a major focus on development of knowledge management systems within consulting organizations, etc. He wrote that the only sustainable advantage a firm has, has comes from what it collectively knows, how efficiently it uses what it knows, and how readily it acquires and uses new knowledge. So we're talking about 20 years or 30 years ago, um, sorry, 20 years ago, uh, he was writing about knowledge. Now, those words turn out to be even more important today because in a time where computers play an increasing role in the decision-making of an organization, we have to answer the following question. What is knowledge and how is it represented in a computer? That is to say, as computers take on more and more decision-making tasks and not just automating repetitive tasks, how do we represent the knowledge that they need to use in making their decisions? Now, first, let's see if we can answer what is knowledge? What is a knowledge representation? On this slide, what we see is the definition of knowledge representation as a surrogate. That is fundamentally, knowledge representation is a surrogate or substitute for the real thing. So in the diagram, what you see is the ch a chair, a physical chair that exists. And in, in the uh, left here, we see a head with the surrogate, the representation of that uh, chair. Now, a key thing about a surrogate is that it's a substitute for the thing itself. The, and it's gonna be used to determine consequences by thinking rather than acting. That is to say, in a computer, we want in a decision-making situation to anticipate or deduce what the consequences of our actions or, re or decisions are going to be without actually affecting the world directly. That is, we want to be able to explore the space of alternative decisions without having an impact on the real world until we find what we believe is a good decision based upon this surrogate, based upon this knowledge representation. What is it a surrogate for? We have tangible entities such as chairs, cars, buildings, people uh, are all examples of tangible entities that knowledge representation is a surrogate for. We also have intangible entities, that is things that do not exist in the world, such as categories and belief and processes, causality, mathematics, e equals mc squared. All of these are examples of intangible entities that we also reason about. So the question then arises, how close is a surrogate to the real thing? What attributes of the original does it capture and make explicit and which does it omit? This is a very important question. How close is a surrogate to the real thing? What does it capture? What does it omit? Because 
perfect fidelity is in general impossible, both in practice and principle. It is impossible to be able to take a chair, a physical chair that exists in the real world, and represent it completely. The grains of the wood, uh, defects in its manufacture, cracks in the paint, whatever the case may be, it is impossible to achieve perfect fidelity, except when we deal with intangible entities, such as mathematics. We can represent equations perfectly. The only completely accurate representation of an object is the object itself. All other representations are incomplete, they're inaccurately inaccurate, and inevitably, inevitably contain simplifying assumptions. So the whole issue that we have to ask ourselves is how close do we need the, the surrogate to be to the real thing? And the answer to that is the level of fidelity is determined by whether the representation is fit for purpose. Fit for purpose is a very interesting concept. It implies there does not exist a single fidelity for all applications, but that the application determines the fidelity required. So let's be clear of that. No representation of knowledge about the real world, except when we're dealing with intangible, intangible entities, and even then it can be problematic, no knowledge representation is gonna have complete fidelity. And what we leave out determines whether it is fit for purpose. Okay, let's explore this concept of fit for purpose. Consider the problem of creating a software program that will recommend the type of wax to put on snow skis, okay? We're getting closer to winter, especially here in Canada. Hopefully we can be skiing sometime this year, uh, depending upon what COVID does to us. Um, and the question is, if we create a knowledge representation to support the decision-making task of recommending the type of wax to put on a snow ski, whose model of snow do we use? Whose model of snow has the appropriate fidelity for the task? Now, you may not have thought that there are different models of snow, but if you're from a warm climate, whether it be Florida or Singapore or the southern uh, areas of China, et cetera, your model of snow is very simple. It maybe has two properties, color, white, temperature, cold. And even from a temperature point of view, it's an, it's an abstraction. It's either cold or not cold. But if we think about a skier's representation of knowledge and the fidelity it has to have, skiers have a much richer representation, a higher fidelity representation of what snow is because they are going to have to make decisions about their, the wax on their ski based upon their representation of snow, which includes whether the snow is powder, crud, corn, grapple, crust, dust on crust, mashed potatoes, Sierra cement, all of this reflects a higher fidelity representation of snow than you would find, so, find in someone who comes from a warm climate. So let's be clear, in our head, we have a surrogate representation of entities in the world. And depending upon the purpose, the task we are gonna perform, our models will be of higher fidelity or lower fidelity. And often we refer to people who have higher fidelity knowledge representations for certain tasks as experts in that area. The consequence of fidelity is that imperfect surrogates imperfect fidelity is that any reasoning done with that representation may lead to incorrect conclusions, independent of the soundness of the reasoning process. You may have a deductive capability that is sound, but if the knowledge that it's performing deduction over is imperfect, then the results of its deduction will be imperfect. 
The question we face again is whether the representation is sufficient for the reasoning to be performed. In other words, is it fit for purpose? Okay, let's go on to the next question. What is an ontology? So I've talked about knowledge representation. I have not have, as of yet introduced the, the, the word ontology into the presentation other than at the beginning. Um, so what is an ontology and what, how does it relate to the concept of a knowledge representation and its fidelity? Okay, an ontology is more than a reference model or a vocabulary for a domain. It answers the questions, what are the core concepts and properties that span the application's data? And to what extent can we generalize them in a useful way? So we're looking, we're, in, we're, we're, we're analyzing the domain of application, we're analyzing our application and asking ourselves the question, what are the core concepts that underlie that application? What are the core properties that underlie that application? And then, what are the key distinctions? Can we formally define the necessary sufficient conditions for something to be an example of, let's say, a concept like snow? So when we talk about what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for the various types of snow that a skier is dealing with, we're talking about what are those properties that uniquely differentiate one type of snow from another type of snow for another, from another type of snow. So the act of designing an ontology is one of identification of the core concepts and properties and that these core concepts and properties can be used to define the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be an example of a concept. And if we do that well, if we do that properly, we can then support a variety of applications. One example being reasoning. Another example can be uh, interoperability, integration of data from multiple sources. Another application can be the reuse of this ontology for many different applications that need a knowledge representation. Okay, we've talked about what an ontology is, let's now begin to see what an ontology is. So I'm gonna show you three levels of an ontology. The way I characterize an ontology may not be totally the same as someone else, but this is my perspective. At the lowest level, an ontology is a knowledge graph. It's a graph representation where the nodes represent classes and instances of classes like a class could be a person and an instance of, of a class could be Rita Yi Man Lee, okay? Or class could be a professor and an instance can be Mark Fox, whatever. The properties represent the different characteristics that are used in defining a class. With that knowledge graph, not only can we identify classes and properties and instances, where the properties are the arcs, the classes and instances are the, are the nodes. We also have some special properties in the knowledge graph. I'll have text there that says boosted with. Uh, we have the special property of something be a subclass of something else. Um, a dog being a, a subclass of animal, a person being a subclass, a uh, human being being a subclass of, of uh, mammal. Uh, so with the subclass of relationship or property, we can create taxonomies and we can define inheritance of properties from one class to another based upon their taxonomic relationship. Now, let's take a look at an example from the area of transportation planning. The area of transportation planning predicts transportation demand over a multi-decade horizon. So if you look at Hong Kong or Toronto or whatever city, there are planners there who try and predict what the demand for transportation is gonna be 20, 30 years in the future because that's how long they have to think about into the future in order to put in place the infrastructure today. But in order to do this transportation planning, they have to predict what the demand is gonna be. They have to predict how many people they're going to be, uh, what the mix of people are going to be, what their trips are going to be to work, to school, whatever the case may be. In other words, it, they have to simulate how the city will change over those decades, how families will come together, people will get married, have children, people will 
Uh, children will leave home, uh, start new households, people will be born, they will die, et cetera, et cetera. And so they have to have a model of how these households, how these people change over time so that they can then determine what the trip requirements are going to be of those changing households. So what are the types of things we need to represent at the knowledge graph level? The knowledge graph level, we need to represent things like residents, households, members of households, residents being members of households as a property, the transportation network, vehicles, trips, et cetera, et cetera. That can all be directly represented in a knowledge graph. But the next level of an ontology is definition and constraints. Just because we have names of classes and properties and instances at the knowledge graph level does not mean we know what their definition is. And this is where you get into the real depth of ontologies. Ontologies not only identify the different classes and properties uh, that you're going to use in your knowledge graph, but they define the meaning of the different classes and properties. And using the language of logic, and there are many different types, types of logic, description logic, first order logic, et cetera, one can construct definitions of the classes that then support automated reasoning, including reasoning such as the ability to classify an instance based upon its properties, determining what class it's a member of. So what do I really mean by definitions and constraints? Let's return to the transportation planning problem. A Toronto, one example of a definition is a Toronto resident. A Toronto resident resides in, owns property, or owns or operates a business in Toronto. That is a definition of a Toronto resident. At this level of definitions and constraints, we can use the language of logic to explicitly specify formally that definition of a Toronto resident. We can also define other concepts or classes such as household. Household is composed of at least one person who resides at the same, same address. Again, that concept of household can be defined at the definition constraints level formally, explicitly, so that it can be used in reasoning, an automated reasoner uh, that is built or top or, or consumes the, uh, the ontology. The next level is micro theory. Micro theory is an extension of, on, of, of an ontology where it includes additional axioms or rules that can perform deduction. So, these rules can be used to answer questions, which is in essence, an ability to do problem solving. I'll give you an example of a micro theory. We can have a micro theory for transportation planning. And part of that micro theory is the prediction of how a household will change over time. One of the rules in that micro theory for transportation planning is that for each year above the age of 14, a member of a household will leave with a probability P age. In other words, if we're gonna simulate the future of the residents of a city for transportation planning purposes, we need to know in one rule, at what point does a person leave home? And notice that we have a probability of age because as they get older, the probability of leaving home is going to increase. <clears throat> so those are the three levels of an ontology, a knowledge graph at the lowest level, which is a graph representation. The middle level provides us with definitions and constraints on the interpretation of classes and properties. And the third level is a micro theory, which embodies a set of rules or actions <coughs> with which deduction <coughs> can be performed. <coughs> so what are examples of knowledge graphs? We're gonna go and look at each level by example. You may not know it, but Google maintains a knowledge graph. In that knowledge graph, there are over 70 billion triples. That is uh, a node connected by a relation to another node. Those are triples. So basically an arc with a node at each end. There's over 70 billion triples in their knowledge graph. 
And when do you run into Google's Knowledge Graph? You run into it every day that you're using Google's site. Because when you search for something, such as Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, not only do you get the search results, but on the right-hand side, you see a summary of Justin Trudeau. Now, we may think Google is absolutely amazing and that perhaps they dynamically construct that by reading uh, a, a billion web pages and extracting all of that information and displaying it in under a tenth of a second, but they're not that smart. What they do is they mine the internet, extracting information from web pages and adding it to their knowledge graph. When, when Justin Trudeau was born, what his height is, who he's married to, the party that he's the head of, where he went to school, et cetera, et cetera. All that is added to the knowledge graph so that when somebody does a search for Justin Trudeau, they go into the knowledge graph, they find the node labeled Justin Trudeau, and they pull out all the properties, such as birth date, married to or spouse, education, et cetera. It's all there in the knowledge graph ready for Google to present it. So you all have experience with knowledge graphs without even knowing it. Or take Apple Siri. Uh, when you talk to Siri on a uh, iPhone, uh, they have embedded in it a knowledge graph. And that knowledge graph is the bridge between speech processing, the sound to text translation, and answering whatever question you, pro you pose. Because once Siri translates sound into text, it then has to have a knowledge representation of what are the apps that are on the phone and what those apps are capable of doing and how those apps can be accessed and what they produce. That's all embedded in a knowledge graph. Or if you've used LinkedIn, uh, they have a knowledge graph that merges the original LinkedIn knowledge graph that, um, that covers things like universities, coworkers, jobs, projects, et cetera, typical LinkedIn stuff, with Microsoft's graph, because Microsoft acquired uh, LinkedIn, which has in their knowledge graph, meetings and contacts and messages, documents, et cetera. The two graphs have been merged. And finally, another example of a knowledge graph is Airbnb. In this knowledge graph, they represent the information you see on the Airbnb site when you go to a web page, such as events, places, experiences, homes, users, restaurants, markets, neighborhoods, etc. So, some of the biggest uh, websites in the Western world <clears throat> are powered using a knowledge graph. So, what does an ontology look like? for real. Let's go back to the city resident example. Okay, I mentioned city resident as an example of something that appears in a knowledge graph. Uh, and I provided a definition of city resident uh, at the second level uh, of what an ontology is. The, let's consider the following. Cities provide many services to the residents but in order to receive those services, the validity of their residency must be determined. Think about that. A city will not arbitrarily provide things to people who are tourists or uh, passing through or whatever the case may be. Certain services are restricted to residents. So the question is, what role does an ontology have to play? Possible uses of an ontological description of a city resident can include verifying that a person who requests a service is a resident. That means that if we have a definition of a city resident in our ontology, then we can use it to verify that a person is a resident. We can also use that definition of city resident to determine in a database of people what subset are residents of the city. So we can actually go through the database and, and determine who is a, city, a resident of the city. Imagine if you have some demographic data, uh, a large set of data, and you want to uh, contact people or residents of the city of Toronto, this can go through and figure out who's a resident and who is not. 
And then you could also use the ontology, the ontological definition of a city resident for validating manually provided classifications of residency. It may be the case that somebody in city service, city government misclassified somebody as a resident when in fact they're not. And we can use our ontological description of city resident to validate uh, data of this type. So how would an ontology help? Let's dig a little deeper into uh, our example of city resident. The problem is we can't come up with a single definition of city resident. Okay, Toronto's definition is you're identified as a resident if you reside in, own property, or own or operate a business in Toronto. Beijing is all individuals holding the nationality of the People's Republic of China who have a domicile in Beijing and nowhere else. And if the individual maintains a regular dwelling somewhere else, the more regular dwelling is considered their place of residence. Uh, I don't think that's from Rita. It's another Lee. Um, New York has their definition. Germany, uh, a resident, uh, Germany says a resident of Germany generally refers to an individual who has a domicile in Germany or spends more than six consecutive months in Germany. It's their habitual place of abode. So let's look at the definition of a city resident at two levels. Here is a knowledge graph that contains what we think are all the right classes and properties you need to represent a city resident. So here we see a Toronto resident is a subclass of resident. It's connected to Toronto via owns property in. It's connected to Toronto via resides in. It's connected to business via operates. Uh, and they operate a business that has an address and that address is in the city of Toronto. So it appears that that graph captures the meaning of this definition. But it doesn't capture everything. And we'll see on the next graph when we go from knowledge graph level to the definitions and constraints level, where we go just from having nodes and arcs whose semantics, whose meaning is based upon our interpretation of the English, English labels on both the nodes and the arcs. And let's be clear about that. The only semantics we have here is our interpretation of what those English labels are. Okay, doesn't mean that we really understand them. At the definition constraints level, we have a more, a, a better definition, which is composed, which is created using our logical language. Here, we see a definition that a Toronto resident is a subclass of resident and resides in Toronto, or owns property in Toronto, or operates a business, and that business has an address, and the address is in the city of Toronto. So the difference here is, we're now saying explicitly, the definition of Toronto is that it's a subclass of resident, and all of these other things have to be true, and, or, or, and, etc. So logic provides us a language for constructing explicit definitions using more primitive properties, that is resides in, owns property, and operates as address, has their own definitions that allow us to interpret the definition of Toronto resident. So this is an example of a definition. But the point is, we're not defining a city resident in general. In our ontology, what we have done is we have identified a set of classes and properties that can be used to construct the def different definitions of city resident. We can use these properties and, uh, and classes concepts to construct a definition of Toronto resident, to construct a definition of Beijing resident, to construct a definition of Mumbai resident, because we have done the ontology engineering to identify the key concepts and the key properties that distinguish one uh, concept from another, the key properties that can be used to define these concepts. Finally, what does a micro theory look like? Micro theory, in this case, uh, if we have the uh, the uh, rule that we saw earlier, 
that for each year above the age 14, a member of a household will leave with a probability of age. Then we can create rules in the ontology that use the ontology by saying if X is a person, Y is a household, X is a member of Y, that is a person's a member of the household, and they have an age Z and it's greater than 14, then the probability of leaving is, is based, of Z leaving is based upon um, is PL. So um, that's just a simple example of a rule uh, that one can construct. And the micro theory level for transportation land planning doesn't contain one rule, but can contain tens or hundreds of rules that are used to predict what the future is going to be, deduce what the future is going to be. So why use an ontology? It, it appears to be nice um, in the sense that, gee, it's fun now that we can construct definitions of the terms that we're going to use of the classes and properties. Uh, we, construct, uh, we can construct definitions uh, such as a residence, Toronto resident, Beijing residence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what are we really talking about as the use of that ontology in this particular situation? We're talking about integration. And in particular, we're talking about semantic interoperability. Where semantic interoperability is the ability of computer systems to exchange data with unambiguous shared meaning. And so the bottom line is, as we begin to focus on ever smarter applications, those applications depend upon data coming from multiple sources. And if those sources have different semantic interpretations of their data, if they don't share the same properties, if they don't share the same concepts, then we have a semantic integration problem because the meaning of the attributes, the values differ both within organizations and across the internet. It's difficult enough integrating knowledge within an organization, let alone integrating knowledge from across the internet. So the bottom line is semantic interoperability uh, is a requirement to enable the more sophisticated, the more intelligent reasoning that we are increasingly expected from the systems that we are building. And if you don't address the semantic interoperability problem from the outset, then whatever you build will be built upon faulty information, faulty integration of data, uh, a poor surrogate, poor fidelity, and that's really the key. We're back to fidelity again. The fidelity of your data is going to be low unless semantic interoperability is addressed. So semantic interoperability is concerned with ju not just the packaging, but the simultaneous transmission of the meaning of the data. And that's really what we're talking about. So why ontology? interoperability, integration of data from multiple sources is a huge problem today and becoming bigger as everybody uh, pursues the big data um, gold ring. And there's a huge problem with that semantic interoperability. There's a huge problem with understanding the meaning of data that comes from multiple sources. Because where is the semantics? Where is the meaning of the data that exists within a particular data set defined? Originally, it's defined in the software developer's brain. Okay? But you don't have access to the software developer, so that's not available. So what do we do? We write documentation. And in theory, that documentation contains a specification of the meaning of the data, the use of the data, et cetera, et cetera. As we all know, documentation is always out of, uh, uh, not out of print, but it lags changes in the original, uh, in the data. That is to say the data is continually evolving and the documentation is never maintained. And then the documentation itself is subject to alternative interpretations. I'll never forget I was in a meeting uh, uh, discussing a, a uh, expert system I built back in 1981. And there was a manual that we wrote for that expert system. 
And so three years ago, four years ago, I was at a meeting at a company that is using that system to do diagnosis of, of uh, steam turbine and generator, electrical generation equipment, and they're still using it. Uh, and they asked me what I meant by a paragraph in that document that was written 40 years ago. Okay. I don't even know what I meant back then, but everything is subject to interpretation. Everybody interprets it their own way. Documentation is not always the final determiner of, some, of the meaning of data. On the other hand, we can always look at the source code, but very few of us will ever see the source code of anything. And so that's not a good source of the meaning of the data. Ultimately, in order to solve this problem, because the meaning of the data is embedded in the code, partially in the code and partially in the data itself, we have to have a means by which we can separate out the semantics from the code and have it be associated with the data itself. And that's really what ontologies give us the ability to do. It gives us the ability to associate the meaning of the data with the data itself. So what is a semantic web? This is an ontology perspective. The semantic web, simply stated, provides a standard for the semantic representation and linking data distributed across the internet. Okay, we have this wonderful internet. We have the World Wide Web, which allows us to request information from one server to another across the world, okay? But that's at the web page level. It's not at the individual data level, okay? So imagine that the University of Toronto and Hong Kong Xu Yan University maintain separate databases on their own servers containing information about their faculty. How could the databases be structured so that the information can be easily integrated? So, if we wish to integrate data from two different locations, if we wish to integrate data from your university and data from my university, the best way to achieve that, perhaps, is to come to an agreement on what are the concepts, what are the properties that we're going to use to represent that data. What that means is, if I'm going to represent the concept of Mark Fox, Mark Fox is a type person or an instance of a person, Mark Fox's given name is Mark, uh, family name is Fox, and Mark knows Rita Lee. Okay, so if Rita and I can agree that my database at the University of Toronto uses the same properties and some of the same classes uh, in, their, in her database, then her database at HKSYU will look similar. Rita is of type person. We're sharing the, the concept person between us. We're sharing the type property, which means that Rita is an instance of a person. Rita knows Mark. Rita has a given name, Rita. Uh, Rita has a family name of Lee, okay? And as long as we both agree on all those properties and the interpretation of those properties, then we're in good shape. We can look at the possibility of integrating that data. But that can be a faulty assumption. Because even though if Rita and I agree, whoever then takes over the maintenance of that database may not understand what each of those properties mean. Maybe they're not a very good English speaker. And so their interpretation of given name or family name may not be the same as my interpretation of given name or family name. And the use of those properties will be different. So what do we do? Well, the next step for the semantic network is to adopt globally available vocabularies and ontologies. That is to say, somewhere there has to be defined a set of concepts and properties that come with a definition so that when we agree that we're going to use that vocabulary or ontology, that we agree that we're going to use the definitions that are provided in it. Now, this is called the friend of a friend on uh, vocabulary, the core vocabulary, it has a concept agent, person, it has properties, names, title. So properties start with a small letter, uh, concepts start with a capital letter, 
Uh, here's the nose property that we saw in the previous diagram. Uh, here's the given name and family name uh, properties. So FOF person, FOF given name, FOF family name. So the key thing here is if we agree to use the same vocabulary, then we identify what the vocabulary is with a prefix. So FOAF colon is a prefix that corresponds to this URI here. So FOAF person corresponds to the entire uh, URI with person added to the end. FOAF first name is equivalent to the entire URI with first name added to the end. And this should be a small f, not a capital F. And so if we agree to that, if we agree to adopt the same vocabulary, then we're agreeing to use the same prefix for identifying that family name is a property that's defined in the FOAF vocabulary. So we can always know where the property is defined, where it comes from, and that we're sharing its use. So that means when we look at the two representations of Mark and Rita, we have now substituted the URIs, FOAF person, FOAF given name, family name, RDF type, that's a different prefix, I'm not gonna get into it, uh, FOAF knows, and notice I have UT MSF. UT corresponds to a, a file at University of Toronto of faculty, and MSF is, an, is a unique representation, a unique identifier of me. So wherever UT colon MSF is used, we know we're talking about me at the University of Toronto. The same is true over at HKSY. We're using, uh, so this should be RDF, I'm sorry for the mistake, this should be R not F. Uh, FOF knows, FOF given name, et cetera, family name. And then we have HKSYU, which stands for hksyu.edu slash faculty. Let's say it's a faculty file. Um, and so YMLI is this whole prefix plus YMLI is a unique worldwide identifier for Rita. Okay. And by doing that, we know that we're talking about the same nose property, given name property, family name property. We know it because we're all using the explicitly, globally unique identifier for nose, given name, family name, and we're using the globally unique identifier for Rita and for Mark. So in essence, when we do this, it's the same as saying that UTMSF, Mark Fox, knows HKSYU, YMLI, uh, Rita. So that is the next step in employing, in creating the semantic network, is agreement of terms, adoption of uh, globally available vocabularies and ontologies. Then the next step is um, how do we actually access that data that's sitting in Hong Kong, versus sitting in Toronto. Well, we have what are called triple stores, uh, which is a database where a knowledge graph is stored as triples. So you can take any graph like this, knowledge graph, and translate into a set of triples where the triple is the subject, property, value. Subject, property, value. So MSF, type, person. MSF, given name, Mark. MSF, family name, Fox. MSF, uh, knows HKSYU YMLI. And once I translate my knowledge graph uh, into this triple representation and is stored in a triple store, which is a database, I can now turn that database into what's called a Sparkle endpoint. And a Sparkle endpoint is a triple store that has a Sparkle interface that is accessible over the internet. And a Sparkle interface is just a version of SQL, Sparkle's a version of SQL that is designed to manipulate triple stores. All the data is in form of a triple. And so if I wanna know who does Mark Fox know, I can select uh, K, uh, question mark K is a variable where match any triple 
the, whose subject is MSF, properties knows, and whatever the value is of the object, bind it to K, which will bind K, uh, KYSYU colon YMLI to K, and that will tell me uh, that I know Rita. So in summary, the semantic web is the application of ontologies to both standardizing and formalizing knowledge across the internet. It enables uh, access to data by computers over the internet and enables a shared understanding of the meaning of data wherever it is located and regardless of whomever created it. So the next part of my presentation is how to engineer an ontology. It's a short, relatively short presentation, but I have to ask the question of Rita, should I stop at this point? Uh, I don't think that it's as uh, germane to my presentation, given that we're now at 9.51. Yeah, uh, you can actually, uh, uh, as, uh, as according to the previous plan, that is like we can have a short break and then, uh, uh, no, 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 there's a question and answer first and then the short break. So uh, up to you. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Um, okay, let me, let me just do a couple of, okay, we'll see what I can do. Okay, now for the final part, how to engineer an ontology. So the first thing that you have to understand when you're going to engineer ontology, uh, that ontology is a, ontology design is a way of thinking. And I'm gonna repeat what I said before. When thinking about designing an ontology, you are trying to answer the question, what are the core concepts and properties that span the domain's data? And to what extent have we generalized them so that ontology can be used for more than one application? And that's really, really important, is the, is the attempt for generalization to be used across multiple applications. And in designing it uh, and identifying what the core concepts and properties are, you are asked, trying to answer the question, what are the key distinctions? What are the properties that distinguish one concept from another from another? What are the properties that are necessary to support the application that you have? And then how can the concept be deconstructed into its basic constituents upon which it is defined? So that is how we think when we're designing an ontology. Question then is what tools are available for ontology design? Today, most ontologies are designed using, or specified, sorry, using description logic, which is a logical language for defining classes and properties. It has less, it is less expensive than first order logic and some other logics, but it was designed to have a certain level of expressiveness while at the same time being computationally feasible. Description logic is written using a logical notation, but, that notation can be translated into something that can be specified on the semantic web. OWL stands for the web ontology language, ontology web language, is an implementation of description logic on the semantic web. So it implements description logic conforming to semantic web linked data principles. And then Protege is a user interface, a tool that is a graphic interface for constructing ontologies that are represented using OWL and can be placed on the internet and are accessible on the internet. The ontology engineering process, this goes back to work that, that we did already uh, 25 years ago, begins with determining the domain and scope and then determining what the competency questions are. And this is really key, and I'm gonna just go into that uh, a little bit before I end. We determine what the questions are that determine the competency of the ontology. We then consider reusing existing ontologies, so reuse is really important. We then enumerate important terms, identify classes and structure as a taxonomy, define classes using properties, define instances and validate our ontology using competency questions. So one of the, a couple of the key pieces of this is what are the questions that the ontology has to be able to support the answering of? 
And when we create an ontology, we don't start from scratch. We ask the question, are there other ontologies that would be useful to integrate into our ontology? And then with that as a basis, we can extend it by adding additional classes, properties, et cetera, et cetera, and providing their definitions. And then when we have completed that, we can validate whether the ontology is sufficient for a task by how well it answers the competency questions we identified here. So let's take an example. Uh, we're draw drawing it from the university environment. The goal is to support a department in deciding which courses are to be taught and by whom. And so our goal, our ultimate goal is to develop an ontology that can model both the courses to be taught, the skills required to teach them, and the staff from whom possible teachers are drawn. So I'm just gonna talk about the competency questions and then I'll finish my presentation. Competency is defined by a set of questions the ontology is able to answer. That is to say, when we refer to an ontology's competence, we're referring to its ability to answer a set of questions. The questions determine the scope of the ontology's uh, question answering, information retrieval, and inferential capabilities. In, in other words, it determines the types of problem solving it can support. The distance between the ontology competency and a task competency is a gap that has to be filled in when engineering an ontology. That is to say, if you start with an existing ontology, its competency, the types of questions it can answer, may not be sufficient for the task. And therefore, we have to fill in the rest of the ontology so we can bridge the gap between the reused comp, uh, ontology and the final ontology that's gonna be used to solve the problem. To simply put, the competency question development process starts with the most general questions yet your scenario requires the answering of, what courses need instructors who can teach the course, and then we deconstruct those high level questions into more simpler questions. What courses need instructors can be deconstructed into what courses does the department teach, which can be deconstructed into what courses are taught in the fall, what courses are taught at night. Uh, we also can deconstruct what courses need instructors, so what skills are required to teach a course, and then what are the skills that the department requires, and so forth. And so one is continually taking the high level, top level questions that you need to be able to answer and deconstructing them. And the process, is even further structured by starting with the simplest questions and then elaborating. There are existence questions of instances. Is there a professor named Mark Fox? Data property questions. What is the age of, of the professor? Object property. Does Mark teach MIE 1501? Classification questions. What types of professors are there? Reasoning questions. Can I schedule this course at 9 a.m.? There are temporal questions. Is the instructor available at 9 a.m.? What courses did Mark Fox teach last year? There are spatial questions. Does Bain 1420 have the capacity, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for MIE 1501? And event questions, was MIE 1501 canceled? So the goal is to identify all the competency questions so that when we are exploring the engineering of that ontology, we are guided by the questions that need to be answered by that ontology. So in conclusion, the level of intelligence achievable by software systems is limited by the fidelity of its knowledge representation. All reasoning systems, whether it be predictive analytics, such as neural nets, depend upon a knowledge representation that is fit for purpose. Sadly, most neural net applications that people hear about don't require sophisticated knowledge representations. Whether it's image understanding or speech understanding, the representation itself is extremely simple. It's a matrix of pixels, it's a speech waveform, extremely simple. When you get into smart cities and the real world uh, of the urban environment, we're talking about uh, nominal data, uh, categorical data, we're talking about sparse data, which in order to be able to build any type of or perform any type of analysis or decision making requires a concerted effort to create a high fidelity representation of knowledge. The tools are now in place after 70 years to create a global network of integrated knowledge that will supercharge cities, smarter cities, et cetera. Thank you.
That's the end of my presentation. Rita, now to you. Rita, you're, uh, uh, you're muted. Your microphone isn't on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And so that we, we have got a, a Q&A section. So uh, uh, for, uh, for those audience, uh, you are welcome to ask questions about like, um, uh, what do you think about the uh, knowledge, uh, 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 knowledge graph, for example, and then some other, uh, uh, some other topics they has mentioned in this uh, presentation, including like research. And then if you have got some research question, like for example, the uh, you may be working on like computer science uh, for uh, today. We have got some of the PhD candidates. You can also ask the questions about the uh, your research as well. So if if uh, you would be so kind to put the question into the chat box, that would be great. Yeah. So uh, please put the questions to the chat box uh, if you have got uh, some of the questions. And then uh, uh, we have got a question uh, from the uh, from the um, from the audience. Uh, so the question is: uh, What do you think about um, the uh, basic um, how the knowledge graph can be uh, can be used in like uh, smart city research, uh, like? Um, the research question, maybe, possibly that may be possible. Well, it's definitely used. And the second presentation I'm going to give is is focused totally on ontologies and smart cities. Um, so ontologies can be used throughout. I think the an example that I gave uh, in the transportation planning domain, uh, I'll go into a little more detail on that in my second presentation. Um, but it can be used across all of the services that exist uh, within the city, whether it is transportation related, uh, parks and recreation, social services, healthcare, et cetera. Uh, there is need for a rich representation of knowledge to allow for more sophisticated reasoning. But again, the examples, I'll, I'll be showing at least five examples uh, in the second presentation. Yeah, thank you. So another question from uh, 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 another question is that there is a uh, hello professor. Do you think that so? I don't know if uh, uh, Rita has frozen on me. So uh, if you can still hear me, I don't know if it's it's my connection. If if you can still hear me, can. Uh, you, you put something in chat saying that you can hear me, please. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, so uh, do you think knowledge maps can, are used in real life? Uh, uh, ontology and ontology are, must in, are a must in our life. I don't see any path to more intelligent systems without the incorporation of sophisticated ontologies, period. So the answer is yes, it is a must. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the second presentation in the context of smart cities. I think we lost Rita. Any other questions out there? No other questions? So I think we're supposed to take a short break. Um, Sarita, you're back.
Rita, you're on. You're on mute now. You're not on mute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just now, I have got a uh, internet uh, in, uh, internet connection problem in my own computer. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, we don't see any more questions on the chat. So, uh, what's the schedule look like? Uh, the schedule that is is uh, uh, we have got a short break uh, after the Q and A section. So that is uh, 15 minutes originally, uh, according to our original schedule. So, uh, so Mark, would you like to have a short break or? Well, yeah, give me a, a little break, but let me answer the question uh, from Lee and Ting. There's one more, yeah, yeah, one more question. Personal privacy so data. personal privacy data will be involved in the knowledge rush. How can we avoid it? Oh. Um, well, you're absolutely right. Personal privacy data uh, will be involved in knowledge graphs. Uh, I'm not sure you want to avoid it. I mean, if the, the, the purpose of the knowledge graph is to represent detailed data about people, uh, then it's going to contain pri uh, personal privacy uh, data. Um, it's the nature of things you can't and again as i said it's it's a it's a question of what the application is if the application doesn't require personal data um then you don't have to include it in the knowledge graph so it's 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 making sure it's not in it by design so we have this notion uh in north america of privacy by design that is designing into the system uh privacy or um, the inability to store certain types of information. Um, and that's a design issue. Uh, it's really not a knowledge graph issue. Okay. And then we have got another question that uh, it asks like, uh, uh, what may be the future direction if we talk about the research graph, uh, knowledge graph, sorry. I'm not sure how to interpret what the future direction. For me, the future direction is the development of ontologies. That is the continued okay. development of ontologies on a domain by domain basis. Uh, uh, another question they ask is like um, for the uh, for the research impact assessment. So a lot of circumstances by the time they write the uh, grant proposal now, it actually asks about like the research uh, impact assessment. So how would you uh, suggest us by the time they write something as a, for the research impact assessment on that? to increase in research impact? Using knowledge graphs or what the impact of knowledge graphs are? I mean, again, the, the, the impact possible. statement of any proposal uh, is really dependent upon what the goals are of the proposal. Um, if the proposal isn't about knowledge graphs, yeah. that is, it's going to use knowledge graphs, but the, the research isn't necessarily about knowledge graphs, then you don't have, obviously, you don't have to worry about knowledge graphs and what its impact is going to be. It's just enabling technology. Uh, but if you're doing research into knowledge graph themselves, uh, it really is a question of what the nature of the research is you're performing on knowledge graphs. If you are uh, doing research into uh, the complexity of searching, pattern matching within knowledge graphs, then uh, the, uh, the impact uh, analysis uh, is going to be based upon what you can do that's faster, better, et cetera. So for example, everybody's doing uh, for 5G, the introduction of 5G, everybody is saying, if we go to 5G, what happens with a hundred times increase in speed? Uh, here's what the, how the world will change. And so the same is true of graphs. If you're, if you're focusing on pattern matching and speed of that, then you know how does reasoning change perhaps uh, with faster reasoning, uh, we increase the capacity of the cell phone. Perhaps uh, we allow cars to make smarter decisions because uh, we can more quickly deduce the impact of certain changes in direction or driving decisions that a car automatically makes. Again, I don't think there's a, a general answer to it. It really depends upon the application uh, or the focus in the knowledge graph. Okay, thank you. So uh, I would like to ask as if there's any more questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, if not, then we will have got a short break 
uh, until 10.15, and then we will come back again. 10.15? So, uh, yeah, 10.15, yeah. It, uh, so, uh, home time, 10.15, <laughs> yeah. And then, so, okay. uh, uh, yeah, is that fine for you? Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, we have got a short break here. Okay, thank you, bye. So, we we're back at 10.15. Uh, But yeah.
Mark, you can just start uh, as if you wish to. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, make sure my... Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And I will pop up the slide. <coughs> Hopefully, you can see the slide. Yeah, you can see the slide. Great. Okay, so the last decade has seen cities explore the problem of making them smarter. Many applications have been explored and implemented, including smart street lights, smart fountains, smart traffic lights, smart garbage collection, etc. In this presentation, the second presentation, I will explore the role of ontologies in creating smarter cities. So first, what I want to do is motivate you as to why it is that ontologies are important to uh, cities, smarter cities. When you think of a city, cities are all, always thought of as being composed of silos, silos of services such as education, transportation, water and sewage, social services, public health, public safety, fire and emergency, parks and recreation, energy. These are all examples of the services that uh, exist within the city. Not all of them, it's not exhaustive. But as you notice at the bottom, it says education data, transportation data, water and sewage data, social services data. The reason why that's listed at the bottom is because each of these services have developed not over a decade or two decades, but often de developed over hundreds of years. They are legacy services. Each service develops its own terminology, its own language for referring to things. Each service developed independent of the other services. So their terminology, their language of education is independent of the language of transportation, which is independent of water and sewage data, et cetera. Now, an interesting result of this that I've seen in a number of cities around the world is that they have what are called thesaurus projects. And those projects seek to identify all the different ways that certain subjects, certain entities, services, et cetera, are referred to across the city. City of Toronto has a thesaurus of subject and services that contain over 20,000 terms for referring to uh, the various things that exist in the city. And a challenge for the city is coming up with a common set of terms, a common ontology, to refer to the same thing across all the services in the city. Because if you can't come up with the same terminology, it makes it impossible to tag information in such a way that it's readily accessible across the different services and also by the citizens of the city. Now, let's make that a little more clear as to why we need to focus on the integration, the standardization, the development of ontologies uh, for the city. Consider the task of paving a road. The Public Works Department will go and put out a request for proposals. It will be sent to contractors and that uh, request for proposals will have a date associated with it, when the work should begin, when the work should end, and a variety of other requirements that a contractor who's gonna pave the road has to satisfy. But that's not the only conversation that takes place between Public Works and the contractor. Public Works has to have a conversation with the Water Department. Why? Because if they are going to open up the road, that's a very good time to start replacing certain pipes that may be over 100 years old under the road that are leaking badly, uh, et cetera. They also need to speak to the sewage, uh, sanitation, uh, uh, the sanitation portion of their city. Also because if they're opening up this, the uh, street, 
There may be sewage pipes that need to be replaced. And they need to speak to the power department because maybe there's power cords running through there that need to be rerouted during the time of, uh, of paving and opening up the road. They need to speak to the permits department to understand whether there have been any events scheduled for that time period, such as a parade or a festival or whatever the case may be, that may have to be moved to another location. They need to speak to the police to understand what impact that has on policing in the area. They need to speak to the transportation department to find out whether that road is being used for major is a major transportation route and whether it's possible to reroute transportation vehicles around that road at that time. And they need to speak to the businesses. That is businesses that are affected by the road being torn up and their customers not being able to reach those places of businesses. So paving a road is not a simple thing. It's not a simple conversation between a contractor and public works. It's a conversation that takes place across many different departments. And in order for that conversation to occur, in order for coordination and determination of when things can occur, we need a common language. We need a common ontology, set of terms by which we can refer to things that are occurring in the city. So the bottom line is, to integrate, uh, to, to create more knowledgeable operations, more knowledgeable, knowledgeable planning and operations of the city, we need to integrate the silos. We need to be able to carry out conversations across the silos, which is not only a coordination problem, but it's a shared knowledge problem. And that means we have to have an integrated city data model. So the challenge in creating an integrated city data model is defining a model where the understanding of the meaning of the terms in the city data model uh, are shared. That is, we're achieving semantic interoperability, as we've seen before in the previous seminar. Okay, that is to say there are terms that are used within uh, across the city where there may be totally different interpretations. On the right, parks and recreation, when you refer to a plant, uh, is referring to a green leafy thing, whereas if you're talking to water and sanitation, when they talk about a plant, they're talking about the sanitation plant or the purification plant, etc. So requirement for achieving interoperability across the services within a city is to address the semantic interoperability problem because when the data is semantically interoperable, it's uh, integratable, then we can support more sophisticated machine reasoning. And we're back to this issue of the, the fidelity of the representation. In order to achieve high fidelity and therefore better reasoning, we need to solve the semantic interoperability problem. Now, what I'm going to do in the remainder of the presentation is I'm going to uh, give a, a, uh, an example of four different uh, ontologies that we have developed over the last 30 years. It's not a complete uh, review. It's only a, a, a little bit of uh, each of them to give you a feel for where we have developed ontologies and in some cases how they're applied uh, within the city context. And then I'm gonna finish up with an overview to what we're doing in the International Standards Organization, IEC, Working Group 11 on Smart Cities in the development of standards for city data. So the first uh, ontology I'm gonna look at is the Tove Enterprise Ontology. The Tove Enterprise Ontology uh, was meant to provide a knowledge representation of what happens in any type of enterprise. In other words, the goal is to create a computational representation of the structure, activities, processes, information, resources, people, behavior, goals, constraints of a business, government, or other enterprise. And the whole point of doing this uh, is that it can be both descriptive and definitional, definitional spanning what is, and what it should be. And ultimately for the enterprise model, this ontology uh, uh, to achieve model-driven enterprise design analysis and operation. So we're looking at a large variety of applications for the, uh, for the ontology within the context, the broad context of enterprises. 
Over the period of 1991 to 2010, the, the basically 20 years uh, we have that we have developed the Tova Enterprise Ontology, we have created ontologies for trust. Uh, how do we represent trust uh, in data, validity of data? Uh, we've created ontologies for how to represent what's referred to as constraint time, uh, where we can reason about the different constraints on when things can occur. We've created ontologies for defining processes composed of activities and state descriptions of what's true of the world. Ontologies for resources, their divisibility, their reusability uh, of products, their parts, their features, their function, their versions of requirements uh, for products, et cetera, versions and traceability. An ontology for skills and competency for human resources. We've created an ontology for organization structure, behavior and control. Uh, ontologies for activity-based costing, online retail, and quality traceability. Now, the, um, let me just give you an example of, uh, two, of two pieces, two small pieces of uh, the organization ontology and the quality ontology, give you a feel for what's involved in them. This is an example of a pattern that is a piece of the ontology and note that we're not showing the definitions here, we're just showing um, the knowledge graph level representation. We're not showing the definitions. You would have to go to the papers uh, where the definitions are provided. But as we can see here, we have an organization that consists of divisions. An organization agent, which could be a person, is a member of a division. That agent has a role in the organization. The role that they play has some goal uh, it requires skills and has some authority, and the authority uh, is related to the ability to perform activities or authorize the performance of activities by another. In that role, they perform activities, and those activities consume and produce resources. So this ontology uh, addresses both structure and behavior within the organization, and that behavior includes authority, empowerment, and commitment. Uh, what it is that agents within the organization are able to do or not able to do, what they have the authority to do, and what they're empowered to do uh, with others. The quality ontology is rather interesting. Uh, we developed this in the context of manufacturing. Uh, and the idea was, uh, how do we determine the quality of what is manufactured and in our research, it became clear that in order to reason about the quality of components, let's say it's an aircraft uh, and you want to know, uh, you, want, you want to be able to figure out why it is that an engine or a wing or something failed uh, in an aircraft, uh, then we have to be able to trace it back to its individual components. And so we created an ontology, that, a quality ontology, that included traceability, the ability to represent what we refer to as a traceable resource unit, uh, which is a homogeneous collection of one resource type that is used, consumed, produced, released by primitive activity in finite non-zero quantity of that resource type. That's just a fancy way of saying uh, that we want to be able to trace a part that is not decomposable into subparts uh, through the the uh, manufacturing process. Now, uh, what you see over here is a set of axioms written in English in, in the research papers. They're written in uh, first order logic. Um, so we, we, we created this, this ontology. We defined the ontology for traceability uh, within uh, manufacturing, and we published that work. And then a number of years later, probably about 10 years later, uh, I started, to, I started to, to receive messages from Google Scholar uh, telling us that uh, the papers that we had published on the quality ontology and traceability were being referenced in papers from the food industry. And I scratched my head and went to one of those papers and somebody had done a review uh, of traceability through the food supply chain. So people were concerned with 
uh, spoilage of food as it moves from the farm through intermediate warehouses, ultimately to when it gets a supermarket, what happened to that food as it traveled through the supply chain? And the paper was on how do you trace things? How do you represent the tracing of, of things, products, food through the supply chain? And in the paper, uh, it states that uh, we had done the original fundamental research in the theory of traceability. And we suddenly saw this paper being uh, referenced all over the place. So while we didn't know we were doing food related quality uh, research, traceability, uh, the research that we did in the quality area in particular traceability uh, has had a, a, a significant impact, uh, not only within the non-food industry, but specifically within the food industry, which was a surprise to me. Okay, let's look at another ontology that we've been creating, the Global City Indicator Urban Ontologies. So what's the problem? Oops. Um, imagine that the city of Toronto uses what are referred to as indicators as a way of measuring certain characteristics of the city. Now imagine that there's a indicator, which is student teacher ratio. And Toronto reports that their student teacher ratio is 14.6 students to each teacher in the school system. And imagine that Melbourne reports that their student teacher ratio is 24.1. The question is, why are they different? And the answer is, we don't know, because when cities publish metrics, there's no way of digging deeper into those metrics. There's no way of understanding why it is that one city's metrics differ from another because we don't have access to two things. One is how do they define what the student teacher ratio is based on and the actual data that the definition was based on. So what happens is that the comparison of cities based upon a set of indicators that are published by various organizations turns into a beauty contest. A beauty contest in the sense that, gee, Toronto looks like they're better than Melbourne, 14.6 versus 24.1, the lower the student ratio, the better, more teachers per students for the students, but we don't know why. And so it just means Toronto looks better than Melbourne, but we can't tell you why they look better. But what you really need is to look below the surface and ask the question, how did Toronto derive their numbers? And how did Melbourne derive their numbers? And to be able to do a detailed analysis based upon a deeper understanding of the definition of the indicator here and here and the numbers used in that computation based upon the definition. So you're probably aware that cities around the world are in the running for being a smart city. That every year there are a number of cities that are given the award of being a smart city. And those smart city analyses are based upon a set of metrics or city indicators. But we really don't understand how those numbers are actually derived. So we started a project in 2012 called the Polynosis Project. And the purpose of the project is to automate the analysis of city performance. That is to say, can we compare the performance of one city across a set of indicators to another city, but be able to explain why they are different? So in order to do that, we had to build an engine that can compare the performance of one city to another based upon a set of, set of indicators. But we wanted to build that engine in a way that it was independent of whatever indicators you're using. So that we had to have as input to the engine, the definition of the indicators. Well, there are a set of indicators called ISO 37120, which define a set of uh, indicators for cities. Uh, it's written in English. Somehow we had to input it to our polynosis engine. 
So we had to translate that text into a, a machine readable form using an ontology. But in order to translate that text, let's say it's the student teacher ratio indicator, we had to have knowledge of what the school system is. We had to have knowledge of what a student, student is, what a teacher is, what a grade is, uh, what primary school is, what secondary school is. So we had to have a knowledge, a representation of the knowledge of the particular theme of the indicator. In this case, it's an education theme. We had to translate that into a representation that the polynosis analysis engine understands. So we had to have an ontology for education. And then it turns out that within a city, the education knowledge may differ from one city to the next. For example, if the definition of an indicator says we will only include public schools and not private schools, we have a problem because in the UK, and I don't know if that's true of Hong Kong, but in the UK, a public school is a private school. In a public school is a private school. In the UK. What does it mean? <laughs> I know it's, it's, uh, it's, um, <laughs> it's difficult to fathom, but anyway, uh, or if we're talking about Ontario versus Quebec in Canada, secondary school in Ontario goes to grade 12, secondary school in Quebec goes to grade 11. So there are different interpretations of the terminology that is used in the indicator definition, which is very city specific. And so we have to have that city specific knowledge translated into using a machine readable, using our ontologies as input to the engine. And then we actually, have to take the data itself, the actual data that you're going to use to compute the indicator value, translate it from whatever representation they have into our ontology so it can be consumed by the engine. Once we have this core ontology, and this is really the key piece, once we define what the ontology is for city indicators, which includes the theme knowledge, city knowledge, uh, et cetera, and the definitions of the indicators, then the polynosis engine can do its work, not before. Then it can apply a set of axioms. Remember the micro theories? It can apply a set of micro theories to determine consistency of the data, uh, consistency between indicators within an indicator. You can do axiom, you can have a micro theory for quantitative analysis, uh, et cetera. Um, so, that's what the Polynosis Project is about. And the part I'm focusing on in this presentation is the development of the Global City Indicator Ontologies. I'm not gonna take you through all of them, but I'm gonna show you one uh, ontology pattern. And this ontology pattern is of uh, a ratio indicator. And what is a ratio indicator? A ratio indicator has a numerator, which is a population size, and a denominator, which is another population size. In the case of the student-teacher ratio, the numerator is a student population size. The denominator is a teacher population size. The student population size is the cardinality, a measure of the size of a population, which is here. So we have a population here, which is a set of students, which is a subclass of population. And that set of students, membership in, in that set of students is defined by our definition of student. And the definition of student is defined by their enrollment in some type of educational institution that satisfies the definition uh, provided by ISO. So what we're doing here is we're providing a knowledge graph that explicitly represents the definition of the student-teacher ratio by deconstructing it into its numerator and denominator, those in turn are defined in terms of sizes of populations. The populations are defined in terms of definition of student, et cetera. And these definitions of students 
can vary on a city by city basis. And these definitions are created using description logic. Populations, population size, uh, population ratios, quantities, cardinalities, all of that are defined using description logic in our ontology. Now imagine if I have a representation like this, I have an ontology that's able to represent the definition like this, then I have the ability to do the following types of analyses. So here is uh, a consistency analysis. That is, we're determining on a longitudinal basis why it is that the student-teacher ratio in 1990 in Toronto increased in Toronto 2010. Why are there more uh, students um, per teacher in 2010 than 1990? Okay, so the re one reason is, well, let, let me come at it a different way. If the only information, sorry, if the only information we have is a student teacher ratio in 1990 and the student teacher ratio in 2010, then we don't have any insight as to why it changed. Okay. On the other hand, if we, oops. If we know the number of students, we know the numerator and denominator of each of these indicators, then the only thing we really know is either the number of students went up or down from 1990 to 2010, the number of teachers went up and or down or stayed the same from 1990 to 2010, but it doesn't give us any insight whatsoever into why the student-teacher ratio changed other than the numerator and denominator may have changed in some direction, but it doesn't give us any insight as to why. But if we dig deeper, Given that a student population is defined by our student definition, perhaps the definition of student changed from 1990 to 2010. Perhaps in 1990, we had our special needs students integrated with the regular students. That means all the, the special needs administrate uh, assistants, staff, and teachers are part of this calculation. And because there are more support staff for special needs students, the student ratio is smaller here than when you merge, sorry, than when you take the special needs students out of the student population along with their support staff. Suddenly the student teacher ratio goes up. So now we know why. Because we can represent the definition of a student in 2010 versus the definition of a student in 1990, we actually know the reason why the student-teacher ratio changed. And because we explicitly represent these definitions, we can compare them, we can analyze them, and determine what exactly is the difference in their definitions. Another source of change or another reason for an increase is that the definition of the city of Toronto in 1990 changed. Why? Because between 1990 and 2010, five outlying cities that were adjacent to the city of Toronto were merged or amalgamated into the city of Toronto. And so we then had to combine all the students, all the staff, and that could have led to an increase in the student-teacher ratio also. But again, it's relying upon a logical definition of the city as opposed to just purely looking at numbers. And that's the power of the ontology. It allows for those definitions to be used in such a way that we can determine non-quantitative changes that are at the heart of why things change, why things are different. The, to date, these are the ontologies we've created. 
uh, in our, our Gold City Indicator ontologies. What's in purple are other ontologies from the web, uh, the OM uh, measurement ontology, GeoNames, place names, Provo for provenance, all time for time, and then geospatial uh, from uh, uh, the geospatial consortium. We have created an ontology for validity and trust, uh, skills, competency, organization structure. These are the TOVE ontologies that we created originally. And then for the global city indicators, we have created a foundation uh, ontology for indicators and then specific theme ontologies for recreation, fire and emergency, education, environment, shelter, transportation, health, solid waste, safety, finance, energy, telecom, water, and sanitation. Uh, these are the only remaining themes within the ISO 37120 uh, indicator standard that we have yet to create theme ontologies for. So basically, we can represent all, almost all 100 indicators defined in the ISO 37120 city indicator standard using our ontology. The result of the creation of this ontology is that ISO IEC uh, has published a standard 21972 upper level ontology for smart city indicators, as you see here. Um, and that was uh, totally based upon uh, the Global City Indicator Ontology we created, the foundation ontology that we created. It has also been adopted in ISO 37105, Sustainable Cities and Communities, Descriptive Framework for Cities and Communities, as their indicator ontology uh, for cities. And this ontology uh, has also been adopted by what's referred to as a common approach to modeling social purposes, social purpose organization theories of change, which I'm going to show you in uh, a few more slides from now. The next ontology that I want to talk about uh, that we've created for cities is the iCity transportation planning ontologies. Uh, transportation planning, as I mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> in the first seminar focuses on planning transportation infrastructure over an extended period of time. Uh, within Toronto, they do it over, I think, a 30-year horizon. In order to do that, you have to predict what the demand for public transportation will be in the future uh, and how do the changes, how does, how do changes in, inf in transportation infrastructure affect uh, travelers? And also determine what the environmental impacts are of this growth uh, from an environmental uh, perspective. The University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute um, has for many years been developing a transportation planning system uh, called GTA model version 4.0, uh, which does travel demand forecasting. It is used by the city of Toronto and by cities in the greater Toronto area to do their transportation planning. So it has been in production use by the cities for a number of years. Um, and what that system does is it synthesizes person, households, cars, and jobs. Uh, it generates uh, what their trips are, activity generation, activity scheduling, what trips they take, where they take it to, et cetera. Um, and, and then uh, simulates uh, all of those people uh, going on all those trips uh, within the city and uses that as a basis of evaluating transportation plans for the future. Our task as part of that project was to develop an ontology that would integrate all of these different applications. All these applications have their own unique data structures. They are not semantically interoperable um, and uh, they were growing more and more difficult to uh, support, maintain, uh, extend uh, because of the lack of uh, their ability to integrate with the other, with the data from the other modules. That resulted in the creation of the iCity Transportation Planning Ontology. Um, and that ontology uh, has the levels that you can see here, an ontology of location, time, units of measure, change, activity, myriology, which is parts sensors, contact, like where do, where do people, how to contact people, organization, person, household, buildings, land use, trips, trip costs, travel costs, oops, 
vehicles, transit, transportation network, and parking. These are all part of the ontology. There are separate modules uh, that we have created as a basis for integrating uh, information from various transportation planning modules that you saw in the previous slide. An example of uh, just the knowledge graph pattern, not the ontology, uh, the definitions, uh, for example, is a road pattern where there is an arc which represents a connection uh, between two points within a transportation network. Uh, it has start and end nodes, has a posted speed, it's in a municipality, it has a toll, maybe, maybe not. It supports uh, one or more modes of transportation, whether it be buses or private cars, et cetera. Uh, that arc uh, uh, is associated with a road segment, which has a location, et cetera. Uh, we have a person pattern where a person is a member of a household that occupies some dwelling unit, uh, which is a unit in a building which has some location. Um, they have a schedule uh, that they follow in terms of going to work or, or school, which is composed of activities, and a trip is composed of activities uh, which have modes associated with it, which occurs on a particular transportation complex, et cetera. So you can see some of the terms reappear here. That's the connection between the other patterns is things like arc. And the trip pattern uh, is what is an entire trip uh, that's taken by a person. Uh, it's via some vehicle, it has a location. That vehicle has a route that is a, a bus maybe going along some route. Uh, that route operates on arcs, which contain some type of route linkage, which operates on an arc. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the ontology is, is very rich in the representation of various types of transportation planning uh, uh, knowledge, which allows for the semantic interoperability amongst all those modules. modules. So the status of that particular ontology uh, is it integrates uh, the GTA model components. Uh, it's being integrated with ArcGIS by Esri Canada. Uh, and it's a basis of a new ISO standard being proposed. Actually, it's no longer being proposed. It's being uh, worked on right now uh, by WG11, which I'm going to talk about in not the next uh, set of slides, but the final set of slides. So now we come to the common impact data standard. Uh, uh, this is an ontology within the area of social services. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is, what is impact measurement or impact management? Uh, impact management is the ongoing practice of measuring our risk of negative impacts and our positive impacts so that we can reduce the negative and increase the positive. Impact measurement is a methodology um, that is used within the social services sector. It's, a, it's growing in adoption throughout social services, at least within the rest Western world, because uh, SPOs, or what are referred to as social purpose organizations, that's an SPO, lack standards for how to measure impact, how to represent their data, they use a huge number of different conflicting overlapping metrics for measuring performance and hence there's ambiguity in the interpretation of, of their metrics. So social services is a world which has shied away from data and quantitative analysis, measurement, etc., because the people who are attracted to social services naturally are not interested in quantitative approaches uh, to to their work. Um, nevertheless, funders of social purpose organizations are increasingly requested that social purpose organizations begin to measure their impact. And this is a major change uh, for those organizations. And one of the big problems, the two big problems uh, are, what are standard methods for measuring impact? And second, are there any standards for data that represent uh, impact measurement? So the project that we have been involved in that's funded by the Canadian government is uh, part of what's called the common approach. The common approach 
uh, has been developing an impact management standard, uh, that is a methodology uh, that is to be adopted across Canada by social purpose organizations. And the second thing that it has been developing is a standard for data. So CIDS is a common impact data standard. Uh, we have one standard, but two formats. One format is a vocabulary. I'm not going to get into it. It's a very simple representation. And the second one is an ontology along the lines that we've seen before. The ontology supports graph databases using, uh, using linked data standards, semantic web standards of what we've seen in the first seminar. The common, data imp the common impact data standard has a core ontology. And again, I'm just gonna show you a knowledge graph of it. I'm not showing you the definitions of everything, but just to give you an idea of the different types of concepts and properties that exist. Uh, an organization has some type of impact uh, measurement model, in this case, a logic model that impact measurement model has stakeholders, that is who is affected uh, by uh, the organization's services. So an, or an organization's logic model uh, has a program, that program has services, and that service is, the service is composed of multiple activities which have inputs and outputs. But a service, and here's where it becomes important, has one or more outcomes. And the outcome is meant to impact the stakeholders. The whole point is for the service to have an outcome that has a positive impact on the stakeholders. Uh, and we also define for any outcome, what are the risk of achieving that positive impact and what are the indicators for measuring that outcome? So that's the core of concepts and properties. There's a lot more to it than that. Uh, when used, we can represent a particular uh, social purpose organization, which has a logic model, uh, which has a program. The program is focused on work and life skills training. That program has multiple services they provide. One is referred to as their street academy. The street academy takes people off the homeless off the street and provide them with the skills to reintegrate into society. Um, a service is made up of activities which have inputs such as number of students enrolled, outputs such as number of students graduating. The outcome here is for that service is enrollment and further education. So one outcome that the Street Academy is trying to achieve is that the students who graduate will then go f move on into further educational uh, programs. Uh, that's measured by the Education Program Enrollment Indicator, uh, which is derived from the number of students graduating, et cetera. There are other uh, types of, of uh, models of impact. This is referred to as an outcome chain, where we can represent a, uh, an outcome uh, chain impact model as having activities which have outcomes, which uh, enable other activities, which produce other outcomes, which can produce other outcomes, uh, et cetera. And also these outcomes have indicators associated with them. By introducing this data standard for social purpose organizations, we can begin moving uh, these organizations from a state of no measurement, no true understanding of their outcomes uh, to uh, beginning measurement uh, to fully measuring uh, what their impact is on their stakeholders. Uh, there's phases of adoption of this standard, this data standard. The lowest is the embarking phase where they can model or represent in the data standard their organization, their outcome, their indicator, and their indicator reports. The building adoption phase then measures outcome impact or represents outcome impact, uh, stakeholders, uh, indicators in, in more detail. And then the aligned phase uh, extends uh, the building phase 
by the SPOs, the social purpose organizations, uh, being able to represent risk, impact, depth, duration, and also program service activity input and output. The adoption, oh, sorry about the, uh, the way the list is coming up. Um, this standard was just recently being released in the last six months. Uh, a new version is coming out uh, within the next month, uh, has been incorporated in, in uh, tools for measuring uh, the impact of social purpose organizations from Symmetrica, Center for Social Innovation, Riddle and others. It's being adopted by the Canadian federal government and there is uh, some major uh, IT organizations uh, in North America that are in the process of adopting this as their standard for representing uh, uh, impact uh, management, impact measurement. Now, this is just an example of a screen dump from Symmetrica's tool for uh, capturing uh, inputs, activities, outputs, et cetera. Within our group, uh, we have or uh, are working on a number of other ontologies. We've built a building energy management ontology, an ontology for 311, uh, the uh, customer service phone number for cities in uh, North America. We are also working with the City of Toronto on the development of an ontology for the water and sanitation department to be able to not only represent their physical infrastructure, uh, but to be able to predict maintenance, uh, perform financial analyses of their infrastructure, perform risk management and, fail and predict failures. So uh, the last part of my presentation is now focused on uh, what standards work, uh, the standards work that we're involved in. Uh, I am a member of ISO IEC WG11, which is a working group 11. Uh, on smart cities. This is the term of reference for uh, WG11. Uh, the one that's important here is develop foundational standards for the use of information communication technology in smart cities, including smart city ICT reference framework and an upper level ontology for smart cities for guiding smart city efforts through JG1. Anyway, whatever. And that's the key thing that that I focus my attention on is the development of ontologies for smart cities. As part of that effort, um, I uh, was the creator, editor of the ISO 21972 uh, ontology standard, which is an upper level ontology for smart city indicators. And if you remember the uh, diagram that we saw before of the indicator, represented in this network pattern. Uh, this standard standardizes uh, the concepts and properties that underlie this. Um, this example just simply shows taking a, an indicator whose description is average number of skills each job seeker gained and translating it into the ontology, representing that definition of this indicator uh, in the ontology. We have a new set of standards that we have begun work on. I am also the editor of these, uh, these uh, standards. Um, it's the 5087 family of ontologies. Uh, there are three levels to it. Uh, the foundation level, which covers general concepts such as time, location, activity, upon which the other levels are built. The city level, that 5087-2, covers concepts that are general to cities and span all services, such as household services, residents, uh, possibly vehicles, uh, et cetera. The key thing about city-wide level, the city level ontologies, is that these are meant to represent concepts that can be both read and updated by multiple services, that these are concepts that are shared across services and multiple services can not only, can not only read them, but can also uh, update them. So that could be information about people, residents, households, et cetera. The third level focuses specifically on service level ontologies. These span concepts commonly associated with a particular service 
but still shared with other services such as vehicles and transportation network. The key thing is it can be read by multiple services. That is the data can be read by multiple services, but it can be updated only by the home service. So as an example of the first service level ontology in the 5087 family of standards, there is 508, uh, sorry, that should say 5087-3. So that's 5087-3 is for transportation planning. And in the future, we will be adding a dash four on water and sanitation, dash five on education, dash six on, and, and so on for other services within the city. The process of development of this standard uh, is iteratively, is to iteratively select a city service, apply the ontology engineering development process to create, extend, or modify each level of the standard. So the foundation level and the citywide ontology will continue to undergo change as we develop more and more of these service level standards, because what we discover in developing these standards will feed back into enlarging the citywide ontology as we find that there are certain concepts or properties from education that need to be available citywide for both reading and writing. Our methodology uh, for developing the, the standards uh, is to identify candidate concepts and their use cases through a detailed analysis of existing urban vocabularies, ontologies, and city enterprise software to reduce the candidate concepts from the different sources into a minimal set of core concepts, to manage and curate an open process where standards development organizations and other experts can comment on the core concepts that have been identified in step two and post modifications, use cases, and new, new uh, concepts, and to formalize and evaluate the resulting concepts from step three, and then promulgate the results through the International Standards Organization. So. The bottom line is our goal in development of 507 is to create an open process so that members of other standards organizations and experts in general around the world can participate in defining the concepts and properties, the ontologies for each of the levels that we're pursuing. What we're starting out with is the uh, ontologies developed as part of the iCity transportation planning uh, ontologies. So those ontologies that I mentioned earlier are forming the starting point of the 50873 levels. Uh, part one contains everything in yellow, part two contains what's in green, and part three contains what is in purplish color. And the way we are moving towards uh, hosting a global conversation around what should be in these standards is that we have developed a website which we call uh, a global collaboratory. And that collaboratory um, is not available yet. It will be available within the next couple of months. And in this collaboratory, you can post uh, classes and properties, use cases, competency questions, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is example of Toronto resident over here. Uh, it's description logic definition, it's UML diagram, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the collaboratory supports a global conversation <coughs> by people to post what they think should be the concepts and properties they think should be in a particular level and for others to then comment on, on this. There's a whole governance process that we have been developing uh, so that we can govern the convergence uh, of what should be contained in the 5087 standard. So in conclusion, the march towards smart cities has led to the realization that there are two approaches in how smartness can be achieved. Everything we hear about today is focused, are, are narrowly focused locally independent applications. But in order for uh, smart cities to achieve the next level of intelligence, we have to move away from narrowly focused applications such as smart street lights or smart meters, which minimize interactions, but also minimize impact. We have to move away to more broadly focused interdependent applications. We have to focus on applications that span multiple 
services such as coordinating emergency services, uh, which entail higher degrees of coordination and efficiency across city services, but require a greater integration and semantic interoperability. And this is a role that ontologies are playing, will be playing within the smart city today and future cities of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. And then uh, uh, we would like to open the question and answer sections uh, to the floor, uh, to the audience. And then uh, we, we, we have got the first question uh, that is asked about the ontology application that AI can share and we use the knowledge uh, and data extensive, exhaustively, but sometimes the words are no longer meaning what they once meant when the misleading jargon emerged. So how to stabilize the definition produced by uh, AI? How to stabilize the definition? Yeah, this was the question that is proposed by one of the audience. Okay, now I can see it. Uh, Okay, so uh, the answer actually is, I mean, this is a, a, this is a well-known issue and the issue arises when the names that you associate with the properties and the classes, the concepts, are interpretable. Let, let's say the names are in English and the names have an English uh, meaning. The, the trick is, or the, the, the approach is, you cannot use the English definition that exists in a dictionary for any of the words used for the name of concepts and properties. The definition of a concept is going to be not your interpretation of the word that's used for that concept, but it's going to be how the description logic definition uh, says the definition is. So you have to separate out of your mind, you have to separate in your mind the specification of the definition description logic versus your interpretation of what the English or Chinese uh, symbols mean. And that's really the key. The problem is for me to show you a diagram where I replace all the names of the properties and the, the, the nodes and the links with random identifiers makes it a lot more difficult for you as a person to understand the network. And so rather than use random identifiers for the properties and links, I use English language words so that you can understand what the, the representation is, is, is representing. There are knowledge graphs out there where none of the nodes, none of the links, have any uh, English or any other language words associated with them. They all just have a unique identifier, um, such as starting with a P for a property uh, or a C for a concept. Uh, and the definition is provided by uh, the description logic uh, definition. And then uh, another Another question that it asked, or maybe I'll just uh, pose it to everybody. So tracing data in World Wide uh, Web can be interlinking. So how to reduce the redundancy uh, in the collected city data? Well, the first thing is, is that, that uh, because you've used unique identifiers as we discussed uh, earlier today, we can actually, re we can actually recognize redundancy so we're happy that we can rec recognize redundancy because we have these unique identifiers for referring to places and people and, and vehicles and, and things of that nature. Um, the question is, why do you want to reduce redundancy? Why is redundancy a bad thing? Is there a rule that says you should only say one thing in one place? I'm not sure redundancy is an issue, quite frankly. And in fact, redundancy is mandatory if you want efficient systems, 
because you may want to locate knowledge that's closest, that's at the edge of the networks, that are closest to its use. And so you will find data that's redundant all over the place within the network. The issue then becomes, how do you make sure that the data that is redundant is updated in a manner that nothing becomes inconsistent? inconsistent? And that's where we get into the ontologies of provenance and validity, et cetera, that allow us to do that maintenance. Another question is that uh, for the software that you mentioned, is it uh, open access so that we can actually use it or uh, that one is just like um, so the that... So description logic is, is a formal notation that is uh, publicly available. It's been published in a large number of papers. So that's freely available. Uh, OWL is a W3C standard. So if you search using your search engine for W3C uh, OWL ontology, OWL, uh, you will find the specification for that. And Protege, the, the, the software tool for building OWL ontologies uh, is publicly available from Stanford. It's downloadable for free. Uh, I don't think it's open source, but uh, it's freely available. Uh, for anybody to use. You just go to, to protege.stanford.edu or something like that. You just do a search in your search engine for uh, protege Stanford and you'll be able to download the latest version. Um, uh, sorry, so what is the website for it? Probably that some of us may wish to know about it. Where is the software in itself? So that probably that we can, we can uh, maybe some of us that we can uh, uh, collaborate uh, by like, uh, maybe with you or maybe with others uh, by using the software because yep. sometimes it's like software that it helps us to do like some of the research and then to build on that research and then we have got another research on that. Yeah. So Stanford, okay. sorry, protege.stanford.edu is the URL for getting the protege tool. Protege. Uh, maybe can you type it out in the in the chat box so that yeah. All of us know where is the software because the software in itself it looks quite interesting, and then uh, probably that we can just explore like what kind of things that like, can be done with that software. There you go. Okay, so it's a photo shape. So, uh, is there any questions from the from the uh from the students today? So, um, uh, so for the um, for the future development, how do you perceive like uh, that will be the future development for uh, this topic, on like ontology, or like knowledge graph, or like for example how that it can be like in the, like within like five or ten years or so, that what may be the future development in this area? Because it's like this area, I think there should be a lot of things that can be done. But what may be the future area that you will? Uh, perceive in this uh, couple of the 10 years or so? Well, I, I have my own uh, uh, limited perspective. Um, that is, I, I, my perspective is for, from the development of, is for the development of ontologies for cities. Uh, I believe that over the next 10 years, we're going to see uh, rich ontologies for the representation of uh, of the knowledge that is found in each of the services that a city has. Um, really what I laid out on the 5087 standard, uh, the development of all the ontologies, the service level ontologies, et cetera, is gonna take at least a decade to get to the point to that we have sufficient numbers of ontologies for the different standards that are out there. Um, I also see that uh, it's gonna take us a number of years uh, for cities to adopt these ontologies as a basis of um, the, representing the data that uh, they use to integrate services. Uh, it takes that long because cities just take a long time to do anything. Uh, and uh, it will take time for their platform providers, that is the enterprise software providers for cities uh, to adopt these standards and incorporate them. 
So if it's going to take us five to 10 years to develop the ontologies, it's certainly going to take longer for the cities to begin to adopt them. But there are, there are major movements in that direction. Uh, the, the Los Angeles, city of Los Angeles is playing a leadership role in developing ontologies for certain uh, services that they have. Um, and uh, so that, that's what I see is the continued building out of uh, application or domain specific ontologies. Uh, at the same time, there still needs to be a lot of work on automated reasoning with ontologies. There are, uh, within Protege, there is a reasoner that allows you to do automated classification, et cetera. Uh, but I think a huge uh, direction uh, in the future will be the development of micro theories associated with the ontologies uh, that perform certain types of reasoning that will be very important. So uh, the development of micro theories, the development of, of the, def the ontologies, definitions and constraints, uh, their application within cities are all very important. Um, so that, that's for me uh, where I see things uh, going over the next 20 year, 10, 20 years. It's gonna take a while. There's a lot of work to do. It's not an easy task to uh, design a, very, a good ontology. Okay, uh, uh, we have got one uh, uh, one audience that would like to uh, ask for your PPT. <laughs> yeah, so if if you're yeah. if you're interested in my slides, uh, send me a request to here. Um, send me a request to msf at eilutoronto.ca, uh, and I'll send you a copy of the slides. Okay, so is it the one that you uh, you sent me earlier or? That yeah, there's a couple of there's there's a couple of changes to it. Um, there's a couple of changes to the first uh, seminar slides. Okay, uh, there is a question from like what actually is a micro theory that you mentioned on the ontologies. <laughs> there's a clarification on the question. The micro theory on ontologies that you just no, mentioned. I, I don't see it yet. Uh, uh, because it's send it. send it send it to me. Okay. So uh, you asked about like what, what actually it is. So what's the question about micro theories? So what, what is a micro theory that you mentioned about on the ontologies? Oh, 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 oh. so that was in the first seminar. The, in, in the first seminar I showed, um, hang on, let me just go and put that up on the screen. Uh, Take a second. So on this screen, I showed you what my view of the components of an ontology are, which has a knowledge graph at the bottom end, uh, which is just a graph structure without any definitions. It just has, uh, it uses names for classes and properties. Next level was the use of description logic or logic to define uh, the classes and properties in the uh, knowledge graph. And then the third level is the micro theory, which is a set of rules or axioms that can be used to uh, perform deduction, answer questions, et cetera. And so the example I used was a rule for predicting whether in a particular year, a member of a household is going to leave based upon their age. So that's what a micro theory is, a set of rules or axioms that perform deduction that actually solve certain problems or answer certain questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark Fox. Uh, thank you, Professor Mark. And then uh, 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 any more questions? regarding uh, today's uh, presentation. So uh, uh, if no more, then I would like to uh, introduce our, uh, our upcoming uh, activities as well. So uh, for our, uh, our next set, we have got, uh, uh, but then uh, maybe before the, the end, before the end, uh, Professor Fox, do you have any other thing that you would like to share with us before we, we talk about the next? <laughs> No, no, that was it. That was it. Okay. So thank you. 
And then uh, I would like to talk about the uh, next presentation that we have. Uh, uh, the next presentation that we have. So let me share the screen. Uh, I also invite uh, Professor Mark Foss to join as well. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so let me, let me click over there. So, um, so the next uh, presentation, we have got uh, John from uh, University of Sunderland, uh, who is actually the uh, Vice Chancellor over there. And then he will talk about the boom of applied uh, artificial intelligence and the need for the ethical AI. So uh, the date will be like 15th of October, 2020. And then we have got the QR code here, so you can actually screen there. And then uh, the time is like 2.30 to 5 p.m. And that is, uh, again, the Zoom, because uh, because of the <laughs> COVID, I think that nobody, I mean, more of us are staying in the, uh, in the same place here. And then uh, so that, uh, well, we just uh, connect everybody through the online, through, uh, through the Zoom. And then, um, uh, and then uh, so this is uh, upcoming activities. And then hopefully we will uh, see you uh, next time. And then we will also uh, send the uh, 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 evaluation uh, soon, uh, soon uh, about uh, all the uh, all the talks that we have uh, uh, organized. So if you have got any suggestions, or even if you have got some suggestions on speakers, like for example, you want to uh, propose yourself as a speaker, uh, do also let us know if you have got uh, this kind of like, suggestions. And then um, uh, another thing that I would like to share with uh, with all of you is that we have got the uh, fintech program. Uh, and then, and this is a, actually an introduction about our fintech program for the remaining three minutes of all. Hi, Rita. There's no sound. No sound. Oh, sorry. No sound. So sorry that we have to share with you sound. Hello, I am Zenbo Jr. What do you want to know? May I know the latest development? Our program is selected by the Hong Kong government to join the Steady Subsidy Scheme for Design Professions, SSSDP, in 2021-2022. The intake places of our program are mainly allocated through the Joint University Programs Admissions System, JUPAS. What other information you want to know? May I know more about the program? Pardon me, I didn't hear you. May I know more about the program? The Bachelor of Commerce, Honors, in Financial Technology covers major areas of 1. Finance, 2. Technology, 3. Applied Data Science, and Four, economics, law and business. It equips students with a now world of big data analytics, computer languages, Python, C, R, Java, etc., comma, blockchain, machine learning and AI and fintech applications. It also offers internship opportunities to students. Graduates of the program may pursue their careers in fintech per se or in forms that employ fintech solutions. Some may opt to work for information technology and big data companies, in regulatory compliance roles, or to launch their own startup companies. The program will also provide a solid foundation for further postgraduate study in the field. What other information you want to know? 
Bye bye. Pardon me, I didn't hear you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Um, so, uh, this is a uh, so that um, so uh, this is the end of the um, uh, presentation of today, and then uh, so that uh, so thank you very much uh, for everybody to come, and hopefully we have some collaboration with anybody here, including our speakers, uh, Professor Fox, and so as the others. Uh, we have got a. So your question is sorry. Okay, so uh, what do you want to ask? Sorry. <laughs> so sorry that I I, I can not hear you, about the question. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for Professor Fox uh, sharing. And then for everybody who come for today's uh, presentation, and then uh, hopefully we will see you. Uh, uh, see you soon. Okay, uh, uh, next week. And then uh, thank you very much uh, for Professor Fox's uh, presentation. So I uh, thank you for everybody as well. So see you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.